Kia ora from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm Amanda Ellis, and I lead global partnerships for the ASU Julianne Wrigley Global Futures Laboratory. I am delighted to be interviewing Thea Trumbuk today, who leads one of the World Bank Group's signature programs, Women, Business and the Law, that measures the impact of discriminatory laws and regulations on women's ability to be economically active in 190 countries. So Taya, thank you so much for being with us today. I know the report for 2021 was just launched in February. So tell us more about why this is so important. Thank you, Amanda. First of all, I would like to thank all the contributors that have uh, participated in our survey this year and without whom we wouldn't be able to be presenting these new results. So thank you to all of them who are watching. No country can achieve its full potential without the full participation of both men and women, and that is even more true today. But the reality is that all over the world, laws continue to hinder women's economic participation and have devastating consequences. For example, women might not choose to work in economies where the law makes it difficult to do so, or they may get paid less than men for doing similar jobs. Over the last 11 years, Women, Business and the Law has presented a unique data set that measures progress towards gender equality in the world of work. Our data and research identify potential areas where more work is needed so that women have equality of opportunity when it comes to getting jobs and starting businesses. As a quick introduction, our index covers different areas where the law might impact a woman's working life. From the basics of just freedom of movement and being able to choose where to live and travel of her own will, to laws that affect women's um, participation in the workplace, uh, laws such as those protecting women from sexual harassment in, at work, to those mandating equal pay. And uh, we also measure many discriminatory laws which prevent women from working in the jobs and tasks that they, want, they choose to. All the way through the rights that women have in marriage and after they have children, to those laws that might prevent women from starting and operating companies in the way that they want to. And finally, we measure laws that affect women's inheritance and ability to manage assets in the same way as men, all the way to the end of a woman's working life in retirement. Women tend to live longer than men, but they often have less financial resources because they work for shorter periods of time and they earn less. And I love these icons. I know this is the first year that you've used this life cycle approach with the icons and it makes it just so easy to track. I am really interested to hear more about the impact of COVID-19 too. We know that women have been disproportionately negatively impacted. Tell us a little more about the findings of the report this year. Well, the findings this, this year confirm something that we have been tracking over time, which is that laws really matter for women's outcomes. This year, we present some new data showing that Better performance in our index, meaning more equal, gen more equal laws, tend to have better outcomes in narrowing the gender gap in development outcomes. We also see higher female labor force participation in countries whose laws are more equal. And we also see more female parliamentarians. Now the causality could go either way. It could be that women tend to legislate more equal laws or that more equal laws allow women to be more, um, to participate more in policy making. But the results are, are encouraging, and we now have 50 years of data that allows us to make this uh, impact even stronger. So it, it just means that where women are more empowered by the law, we see better results. And that is very That's important fantastic. now during, during the pandemic. Thank you so much. This is, this is really amazing data to have over 50 years. And we know from previous work done at the, at the World Bank too, that it's not just better for women, it's better for families and communities. And when we look at the macro level and the macro level data, I was fascinated to see McKinsey's recent study that showed that with a gender informed COVID response, $13 trillion could be added to the global economy by 2030. Yes, that's, that's true. And you know, we have seen results are starting to come out on the impact of COVID-19 on different, different populations and we're seeing really a detrimental effect on women. We see more women leaving the workforce and we have this year 
researched a little bit more in, into this to see what governments are doing to address the impact of COVID-19 on women. And we are seeing that this uh, pandemic has really worsened the inequalities that women have faced and exas exacerbated uh, wage inequality and the gender pay gap. And so here we have some results from the enterprise surveys of the World Bank that have surveyed firms both pre and post pandemic and have found that female workers are leaving the, are leaving the workforce in much greater numbers. But when they have asked them, what are the reasons for leaving? Um, it's not that they have been furloughed or, or laid off in greater numbers than men, is that they're choosing to leave because of difficulties in, restrict, in, uh, in commuting or in mobility restrictions, in ch because of child, increased childcare or inability to, to go to work. So they're choosing between um, their families and their workplaces and they are leaving in greater numbers. And so we have looked at what, what measures governments have taken to address this and we've found that there has been uh, some progress here. The governments are responding to the childcare crisis in over 40 countries. We found new measures introduced during the pandemic. There have also been measures to improve the access to the court system so that men and women can go to courts to deal with matters of child custody or domestic violence cases. And we have seen an increase in number of services to survivors of, of violence, but it's still, not enough, there's not enough happening and, and the efforts are concentrated in high income economies. We will continue to track this. That's, that's a great initiative and so important to be looking at what is actually happening in response to the pandemic. What else is new this year, Taya? Was there anything surprising? I just have a couple of slides that showed some results from the COVID, but uh, there are some surprises and some not surprising results. So when we, when we look at the progress that has been made in the areas that we measure, we find that reform has continued, which is good, but it's continued at the slow pace that it had been happening before. And so today, women still have only three quarters of the legal rights of men, which was the same finding we had last year. There's been a slight improvement in the index from up to 76.2 points in, 20, in 2020 compared to 2019, but still, we are far behind. We see that uh, progress has also been uneven. The regional distribution, as you can see in this slide, uh, high income OECD countries perform better and we have the regional distribution has not changed much, but we do see a great variation within regions as well. And this, we have seen a lot of progress happening in those regions that needed the most, such as the Middle East and North Africa. And we also see this is a similar result to, to previously, although we have seen some reform, the areas of the law that are really the furthest behind are related to pay and parenthood. And the pandemic has really brought, highlighted that how important this is. When women are choosing and when families are choosing who stays home and who goes to work, it's usually the parent that makes less money. And so when laws prevent women from, the, from choosing the jobs that they want, they get often they get um, segregated into certain occupations, which we have seen first have been more more exposed to the virus. So women have been more participate more in healthcare, uh, but also some industries that have been affected by closures and travel bans, such as leisure and tourism, as well as education. And so we have really seen this occupational segregation that often happens because of the law has put women in a worse standing during the pandemic. And it is phenomenal to think that equal pay is still an ongoing battle. Have there been any countries that have legislated for equal pay that you've seen in the report this year? Yes, uh, so we have seen 27 economies reform this year. And in the area of pay, this is where we have seen the most progress. And so we have seen uh, economies from um, New Zealand where you are legislating equal pay for, for equally valued jobs all the way to the United Arab Emirates um, and others who have introduced this for the first time. We've also seen uh, many countries removing restrictions. So Saudi Arabia did that, um, as did Vietnam. They removed all restrictions on women's work in different industries or in different hours. We've also seen um, the second most, most popular reform has also been in parenthood, where uh, economies are introducing parental leave and paternity leave so that Parents share the burden of childcare. And this has also been a positive development. 
I'm very interested to, to read that still there are over 1,600 discriminatory laws. So it's great to see that there are reforms happening, uh, but tell us a little bit more about what's still done. Well, I, I wanted to show you the slide of the 50 years of progress that shows that every single region in the world has improved over time, but that reform process has been uneven and quite slow. All regions have room to improve and there are now, you know, according to our latest data, there are 88 countries today that still restrict women from certain jobs. That translates to 2.6 billion women that cannot choose the jobs and, and the type of work that they want to do and that's best for them and their families and their economies. So I think we really need to speed up the pace of reform. Uh, at this pace, if we continue, it will be another 30 to 50 years, depending on the region you're from and the pace of reform there before we get to gender equality. Wow, over 2 billion, that, that's extraordinary. But I guess just reflecting on 2020, which was really a watershed year for gender equality and the fact that it was the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Platform for Action, at the 10th anniversary of UN Women, the fifth anniversary of SDG5 on gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. And it was so disappointing to see that not a single country had yet achieved full gender equality. I, I know that you're going to be telling us soon how many have achieved gender equality under the law because that's a necessary, if not sufficient condition. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to you later. Yes, this is, uh, this is the slide that shows how recently we have seen gender equality in the law. So 11 years ago, when we first started this project, there was no country that had legislated gender equality fully. We have seen countries joining this over the years, and this year we're excited to have Ireland and Portugal join the group of countries, and we now have 10 countries in the report that have all the good practices that we measure. So these are really the role models, because that's only 10 out of 190 yes. that you're king. Wow, and I see all of them are in Europe, Except for Canada. Except for Canada, yes. We would, be, we would really like to see this spread to other regions. And when we look at the type of reforms and some of the good practices that exist, as I've shown previously, there is, there is if every region adopted the best practice within its region, we could have more countries around the world achieving gender equality. And as you said, this is an important first step, but it's not sufficient. A lot more has to be done to reach gender equality in practice. And it... Teo, when I served as ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, it suddenly dawned on me that the incredible work that you had been doing at the World Bank Group is so useful for the universal periodic review process at the Human Rights Council, where every single UN member country has its, uh, its laws considered, including gender equality, every three to five years. So I'm excited that we are going to be soon launching in partnership with you, a mechanism for parliamentarians and activists and change makers to be notified so that they will be able to see the results of your reports in their inbox uh, a year prior to the universal periodic review process. And we're hoping that with the measurement that you do each year, that that might help to spur progress. Now, we have a, an intern from the United Nations Girl Up program, and they're hoping to engage young women also around the incredible work that you do to be able to take that forward. So I know that we have just a few more minutes, so love to see your remaining data points, and then let's talk about what our audience might be able to do through target gender equality. Yes, um, I wanted to show you our, our newly launched website, which has some new data visualizations uh, where you can see and you can choose to compare the countries that you'd like on the index. Um, and so you can choose the different regions and the different indicators and the different years. It's taking a bit of time to load, but I thought that it would be interesting for the viewers to see this new tool that can be used and then it can be, these visuals can be copied into presentations or used in reports. Um, under our data tab, you can also access all 51 years of data 
Um, and we have now for the first time, we're showing economy snapshots. And so I know that these are the ones that you have, were just mentioning will be sent around. Um, so I wanted to show an example of a country so that you can see, um, wait, I've already loaded it. So this is, for example, um, what the Ecuador snapshot looks like. So it tells you a little bit about the report and what is being measured. It shows the score for Ecuador. It shows the different scores and the different indicators. So you can see when there's 100, it means that all the data points that we measure um, have a positive answer. And then the ones that are not scoring at 100, that's where there's room to improve. There's a bit of an explanation on the relative strengths of the country and the relative areas of improvement. And it notes any recent reforms that were captured in the most recent report. And then on the second page of the snapshot, you have all the data, including the legal basis on which it is based. And so if there are any um, areas that need to be reformed, you know exactly which law and article is the one that needs to be addressed. And so we hope that this will be a useful tool for policymakers and um, advocates all around the world to really shine a light on where change is needed. That is such a brilliant innovation and wonderful to be able to get the snapshot with the icons at the top. And then for those who want to see the full legal basis to have that data so transparently laid out is just brilliant. So thank you to you and your team for the amazing work that you've been doing. And we really hope that this will be a tool that the United Nations Target Gender Equality Group will be able to use uh, as they advocate for positive change. And I guess I would love to just invite you to conclude with any last thoughts that you have on what you would like to see viewers do. Well, we'd love for you to visit our website, download the information, give us feedback, read all the reports and analysis that we have produced. Um, this data is a public good and we would love to have more users using it both in research papers to really show, prove, give that evidence that is needed for policymakers to be convinced that gender equality in the law is an important first step and it's not happening fast enough. Just outstanding. Taya, thank you and your team for the brilliant work that you're doing and we'll all look forward to becoming advocates for positive change and yes. hopefully seeing a lot more than 10 countries on your list next year. Thank, Thank you. So Thank you, Amanda.